Today I will be presenting a short biography about Phyllis Wheatley and then I will be reciting a poem written by her to George Washington. Phyllis Wheatley was born in West Africa and was kidnapped in 1753 at the age of eight. After the ship docked in Boston, she was purchased by the Wheatleys, who gave her her surname. Her first name derived from the Phyllis, which was the name of the slave ship she was on. The Wheatleys were compassionate, so they allowed their 18-year-old daughter to teach Phyllis literature, Greek, and Latin. As Phyllis Wheatley grew up, as did her intelligence, John and Susanna recognized this and excused Phyllis of all of her duties. At just 12 years old, Phyllis Wheatley received recognition as well as criticism from slave owners and her own race. In 1773, at 20, Phyllis wrote poems on various subjects, religious and moral. Voltaire, King George III, and George Washington are prominent people who commended her for her work. Poems on various subjects. Wheatley was continuously accused of not actually writing her own work. At one point, she even had to go to court to defend herself. It had to be published in London, England, because of criticism and racism. John Thornton is another prominent person who defended Wheatley and her work. Although Phyllis received recognition from prominent people in her era, Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral was not published until 1773. After her success, John gave Phyllis her freedom. Wheatley continued poetry and married a free man, but was poor. She died at 31 years old in Boston, Massachusetts. This is actually a statue of Phyllis, and it's in Boston at the Women's Memorial. And now I will be reciting a poem written by Phyllis Wheatley, and after each stanza I will explain what the poem means in simpler terms. <clears throat> Celestial choir, enthroned in realms of light, Columbia's scenes of glorious toils I write, while freedom's cause her anxious breast arms, see Mother Earth's offspring's fate bemoan as nations gaze before scenes unknown. This stanza describes Columbia's, which is another word for America's, struggle to be free from England. The line with Mother Earth expresses her discontent with the nations. Muse, thou propitious while my pen relates how poor her armies through a thousand gates. As when Aeolus heaven's fair face deforms and wrapped in tempest in a night of storms. Or think as leaves in autumn's golden rain, such and so many moves the warrior's train. This is imagining military triumphs, and Aeolus is a Greek god who controls the wind. Shall I to Washington their praise recite? Enough thou knowst them in the fields of fight. Be first in peace and honors we demand. The grace and glory of thy virtues more. Hear every tongue thy guardian implore. Wheatley is describing how Washington and the troops will not back down from battle until freedom is achieved. Proceed, great chief, with virtue on thy side. Thy every action let the goddess guide. A crown, a mansion, and a throne that shine. Washington, with gold unfading, Washington be thine. Once again, Wheatley is expressing her admirance of Washington and also describes him as virtuous. And that concludes my presentation. Sir, do you have any um, idea when George Washington became aware of this poem? This is something that was published widespread or maybe was hand-delivered. Do you have any idea of when he would have become aware of that? This poem was actually very criticized because of the fact that George Washington was a known slave owner. So that's why it got around as quickly as it did, and that's how he found out. And he actually met her, but they only got to speak for 30 minutes because they both had very busy schedules, and she had to go to London back and forth because a lot of people wanted to meet her. Do you have any idea how that conversation went? Do we know how, how Washington received this as far as, you know, what does he think about this poem? given his controversial background? He was very, very kind to her. 
and that surprised a lot of people because of the fact that he was a slave owner and he actually basically told her that he was proud of her because she went against a lot of views that people had and she wasn't afraid to do that. When her, when her writings and poetry first are published in, in and around Boston, do most people automatically know that this is a, an enslaved person, a person that has a background of being human property? Or, or is this... Is she allowed to publish it with the assumption that she's just a woman? We don't know she's a woman of color. Um, actually, since her last name is Wheatley, and because of the fact that her slave owner's family's last name is Wheatley, everyone pretty much knew her around Boston. And poems on various subjects, religious and moral, John Wheatley actually had to put an attestation in that, which is basically saying that she did write this in order for her to not be sent to jail. So when news of her writings make it to other countries like France and, and England, and you mentioned Voltaire and, and King George III actually reading her poems, where they were at that point, is that part of the sensation, or is she making her, her way in the world of writing based off of just her work? Actually, what I like about this is the fact that it was a big leap for African Americans in general, and a lot of people in England knew about her. So, let's think about her setting. I know that we don't ever want to assume that being at the right place at the right time is a, is a huge thing, but in her situation, if her family uh, in, in bondage would have arrived in the South, for example, or, or she'd been sold into a family that did not allow her to, to read and write, how might her story have been different? Um, she already had health issues, so she couldn't really work even when she was enslaved. So I think she would have had a much shorter life if she would have been with her family and she would have not been able to do what she was allowed to do. So this is a woman that, at her time, the mere fact that she's a woman being able to have this type of education is very rare. And the fact that she's a black woman, it's almost impossible that anyone else would have had this level of education. She speaks other languages. She has a mastery of Greek history. That's she why she was so looked down upon, because of the fact that she was a woman and the fact that she also had a skin color that wasn't accepted in that time, that's what makes her so special, in my opinion. So she's recognized in Boston, and we have some of her surviving poetry, even at Mount Vernon today. Why don't we know more about Phyllis Wheatley in modern American history? I think it has to do with the fact that she wasn't really that successful because like I said after she was free she was very poor she had to work as maids in boarding houses and she actually died and her three month old baby died three hours after she did so I think the fact that she didn't live a whole successful life but since the time she died I think that's why no one really knows about her to this day do you think that her poems had any long-term impact on, on men like George Washington after the war I think most of her poems that had to do with the American Revolution kind of fueled the rebels, and I think that it kind of made them feel more confident about it as well. Anybody else have a question? All right, thank you very much, Ms. Story. Thank you.